I am Karin. And I'm Andrew. And we are the new botanist. Today we're going to talk about the mother-in-law's tongue. Uh, Andrew, what is its real name and what can you tell us about its roots? Yeah, well, the mother-in-law's tongue actually has several different names, uh, such as the snake plant and the St. George's sword. Now, we know it as the mother-in-law's tongue because traditionally mother-in-laws have sharp tongues, apparently. And that's a creative name for the plant because it grows quite long and it has sharp edges. The botanical name is actually Sansevieria tricifata. And it's actually native to Western Africa from Nigeria all the way up to the Congo. Does that mean it likes quite hot and dry conditions? Yes, it's a desert, well, traditionally a desert plant. Uh, it's very tolerant to low levels of water and it loves direct, unfiltered, bright light. So it survives, obviously, in very dry parts of the world and it's very tolerant and forgiving as a house plant. And it comes in a huge variety of forms. So you can have the ones with the yellow edge. So it's green sort of wavy pattern on its leaves. You can have light green, dark green, uh, cylindrical shaped ones. Uh, and those ones you can actually plait into different forms, which you can get at various shops. And then you also get very squat ones. So they come in a huge variety and they're very tolerant and forgiving. You say uh, is it, it likes hot and very bright direct sunlight that's really interesting because mine generally are in relatively dark conditions and doing fine in fact I bought it based on the idea that they could tolerate quite dark conditions hmm. if you want the perfect plant you put it on the southwick facing window or in a greenhouse that's heated specifically sort of over the winter and they'll proliferate whereas if you put them in not ideal conditions like we've discussed in other episodes they will survive they will grow but they won't proliferate and sometimes you don't want plants to explode you want them to slow their growth down so probably what you're facing is a plant that's just getting along but not doing massively well but sometimes that's all right you know you, you really like its form you don't want to have uh, suckers which is where you can propagate other plants so you just want to keep it Nice and streamlined. When we're talking about propagation of this uh, plant, I've in the past just sort of taken it out of its pot and split it sort of more or less down the middle and put it into two different... I mean, you, you kind of tease the roots apart a little bit, but then put each one in a single pot. And usually that seems to stress them out a little bit at the start, but they do tend to then sort of be okay with that. So... Is that the right method or is there actually a better way of splitting them? So when taking cuttings, the plant is stressed, but eventually it will calm down. It will repair the broken roots and grow. There's actually several different methods. You can take them uh, via pulling out the additional growth. So they grow by sort of moving outwards. So they have lots of suckers. These are clones, uh, not actual babies. So they'll grow from the bottom of the pot and grow up. And these plants really like being crushed in the pot. But not too crushed, but obviously that's a very difficult balance to have. But if you pull your pot out and the plastic pot is very distended, that's time to break them apart. So as you just described, you can pull them off from the side, try to get as much root as possible and then pot them up. Or you can actually take uh, cuttings from the leaves. So you can actually cut the leaf at the bottom and then make a series of uh, cuts up to about 10 centimetres even if it's just a square piece, and then put it into some water in a tray uh, or a damp bit of soil, and it'll grow roots. Uh, not all will, but uh, you'll get quite a few plants that way. Wow. So you can actually just take the take the actual leaf, do some cuts in it, and put it in a, in a little bit of water. So how does it start to show that it is ready to be planted then? Essentially, if you take cuttings, the leaf... Uh, it will keep growing, but uh, it will die eventually. So this is almost like a power generation, uh, powering the roots. The roots then grow, and then it'll, you'll have a new little plant like, right next to the leaf. Uh, eventually the leaf will die back, and then it will produce a new plant. Uh, not going into too much science and bogging down with all sorts of 
technical terms, plant cells are very special because they can grow into lots of different versions of uh, specific plants parts. So the cells from the leaf can actually generate root cells from which to grow a new plant? Yes, so the cells in the leaf uh, are specialised leaf cells, but uh, with specific hormones and encouragement, they can actually change to growing roots. It can produce lots of different plants. It's a very special property of the whole sort of plant life. Do you ever use um, these kinds of hormone pastes to help cuttings grow more quickly or grow roots more quickly? So this hormone powder, this paste, it comes in all sorts of forms, gels, contains uh, auxin, which is a plant hormone that uh, basically tells plant cells to convert into roots. It helps the process along. And for outdoor plants, I would definitely advise it, especially with the hardwood cuttings. In house plants, generally speaking, it's not necessary because things like deviled ivy, uh, the mother-in-law's tongue, Chinese money plant, they don't really need it because they have so much of this special hormone. So when you take a cut and put it into water, they will produce roots without it. So you can use it, but it's not it's not really necessary. I see. Um, so you said there are loads and loads of different varieties um, of this plant. What actually causes them to have so many different species of the same plant? It's basically from evolution. So if you have one plant on an isolated island, it would evolve not to be perfection. That's not what evolution is. It's just about getting along in that particular niche. So one plant might be growing in full sunlight. It doesn't need as much chlorophyll because it will overload its system. So it becomes paler. Or if you've got a plant that grows in the dark, it needs more of this uh, chlorophyll to produce more energy because there's not much around. So it becomes darker. Sometimes there's genetic uh, mutations, defaults, uh, things that essentially the plant cells don't really want. So this is where the variegation comes from. Uh, and we breed it in because it looks pretty to have white patterns, dots, strips, yellow patterns on our plant leaves. But it's, essentially, it's a genetic mistake. Uh, it won't kill the plant, but it reduces its capacity to produce energy. In in terms of their care, um, I I don't water mine very often. Maybe once every three weeks. Maybe sometimes even only once a month. Um, mm. And they don't seem to mind that very much. Now I'm aware that I, I, I might be stressing my plant by doing that. But I just wondered whether you could tell us a bit about what does the plant like? Generally speaking, they prefer to be dry. Uh, but when you do need to water them, uh, lift the pot out. You can feel if it's light, so there's not much water. Put your finger into the soil for about 10 centimetres. And if it's dry you could start to water and always water from the bottom. I mean, it, it, essentially, it's not too much of a problem if you put it on the top, but if the water stays around, it can rot the uh, stems. When you say water from the bottom, how practically does that work? There's two sort of main methods to choose. So you take the, usually what you have is a plastic plant pot with holes in and the plant, and then you have a pretty glazed pot or plastic pot or metal or whatever material you want. You just take it out maybe put it into a sink with filtered water and leave it there or a bath or if there's enough space so you can see the bottom uh so about five centimeters of space enough to put your finger down you can actually water the put the water into the ceramic uh pots and then keep the plastic plant pot in and then always check by lifting the plant uh if you do overwater it for some reason you flooded it or forgotten about it after hours of being in the sink take it out directly and then get dry material like toilet tissue or kitchen roll and put that on the bottom of the pot and it'll draw the water back out. I wonder whether you could say a little bit about why it is so important to dry them out, to let them let the soil dry out between waterings. Mm. So in uh, nature again, because this is where the plants are from, take more extreme examples like cacti. Uh, in the desert, it's usually quite dry, the soil's dry dry air and then there's usually a downpour very quick downpour the plant roots are adapted to soak as much water as possible and then it dries out and then it holds on to that water and then it runs out it goes into stasis and it downpours again so it's an extreme environment whereas in our homes if we keep watering uh, the roots will take up as much water as they can and then they'll keep doing it and then it causes rot 
roots do need oxygen that's the main part so if you flood it and um, plants are completely submerged in water they'll die because they're drowning essentially i wondered what type of plant a mother-in-law's tongue actually is because it feels very different from the green leaves of say a devil's ivy or many of the other regular house plants or the house plants we've talked about it feels somehow more like a succulent but it also seems a bit different from a succulent so it, 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 it what is it it is very like a succulent and it is more it would be a succulent compared to a tropical plant because the lack of water but they are not really classed as succulents a little they're very like succulents but they are a perennial herb that's brilliant to know um i don't know whether that gives me any <laughs> any more <laughs> knowledge about its care but this podcast will so that's all right so in terms of things that can go wrong with it and the signs that it gives off like can you can you tell us something about that uh unfortunately because it is so tolerant it will just stay quietly in its pot and it'll just suddenly go because it's been too quiet. It won't tell you. The most obvious sign is when it does need a water. So if you completely forgot to water it, the leaves will look almost like they're being sucked in and it's beveled. And a lot of houseplants do look a bit beveled, especially succulents, where if you feel the uh, leaves of a succulent, it will feel very bumpy. And that's almost like, water me now, please. So the mother-in-law's tongue gives that away. It's very subtle. Uh, but if you look at the texturing, it's quite smooth. But when it needs water, it gets very beveled and almost gaunt in appearance. So that's when it's like, water me, please. It's not irreversible, is it? Uh, if you leave it long enough, it will be irreversible and it'll die. But you will it's a first warning sign. If you water it nine times out of ten, it'll be fine. And the uh, mott little gaunt appearance of the plant will go away. It'll fill out. And that's what naturally cactuses do in the wild they use their water reserves they look sucked in and gaunt and then when it rains they suck up the water almost like a sponge it's just such a striking plant i think and it works so well in quite small spaces because it just grows upwards so i think we can say that we really recommend this plant absolutely it's a classic house plant as all the plants we're covering and it's really tolerant really tolerant uh so definitely go for it Thanks so much for listening. We hope you will join us again next time for more tips and tricks on how not to kill your plants. If you'd like us to cover a specific plant or have any other questions, you can get in touch via botanicaldoctor.co.uk.